what was the need for a quantum field theory? What is quantization? What are the effects of quantization? How light is treated in quantum field theory? In this video, I am going to answer all these questions and going to take you through an interesting, paradoxical and a mind-boggling journey in the world of quantum field theory. You will also come to know the underlying reason for the need of this theory and other important details. There will be simple yet very important certain mathematical calculations to make your concept clear. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. Welcome to the third lesson of Introduction to Quantum Field Theory. First, let us look into what are the topics that we are covering. So, we are covering first a quick recap for those who have missed the first two lessons. I am going to give you a very quick recap on the most important topics uh, and the concepts. We will understand what is quantization. The most important, what is the principle of least action, Noetius theorem, Planck's constant, consequence of doing a quantization, Einstein and quantization, quantization of light, the photoelectric effect. Plus, there will be other few more things which I am not mentioned in the topics. Just to make it more interesting, let us go ahead and start with the third lesson of quantum field theory. So first, what we would do is to make a quick recap. Now, first thing is that we need to understand why do we need a unified field theory like a quantum field theory. So we know that classical physics of Newtonian mechanics is primarily uh, defined as the second law of motion, that is force equal to mass times acceleration. The relativistic physics of Einstein is primarily dominated with E equal to mc square and quantum physics is basically dominated by Schrodinger's equation. And the base, this theory, this field equation which is you are looking is basically of general theory of relativity which says that gravity is no more a fictitious force but just a curvature of space time. Now if I take the quantum physics and then unify it with general relativity, what we get is a string theory. And if I take uh, classical physics and I take relativistic physics together and along with quantum mechanics, we are looking for a quantum field theory. So what I am trying to tell is that the quantum field theory is a kind of a unification of special relativity, classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. However, general relativity and quantum physics are still striving to get united into a string theory. Now you see that this is basically that was the need that we can find everything one together. A another important part is that we have looked into what is quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics in the previous two videos. So here is a quick recap. Describes the interaction of charged particle with electromagnetic fields and QCD, quantum chromodynamics, describes the strong force. A QED defines interaction between charged particles and EMR. This is interaction between charged as well as uncharged particles. Particles and electromagnetic radiation exchange photon between them. Here particles exchange gluons. This is built on electromagnetic force and this is built upon strong force. So we can say that QED is basically electromagnetic interactions which takes place between charged particles and here the electronic QCD is describes the interaction between quarks and gluons. Now we have earlier found that in order to go ahead with the quantum field theory what arises are infinities, divergence and many other problems. So Julian Schweinger, uh, uh, Freeman Dyson, Richard Feynman, Shinshiro Tomonaga all of them actually are Nobel laureates except Dyson. They find out a solution, they found out a solution which could replace the infinity calculated values by their finite measured values. So this is a concept which we are going to look more into this part of our video today, which is called renormalization. That means we are fighting with the infinity and the divergence and we want to find out something which is finite. And this was also done by Richard P. Feynman in his groundbreaking work on Feynman path integral formulation for which, which he won the Nobel Prize in Physics. 
So the recap actually tells that if you get a kind of an electron field, a positron field and a neutrino field, all these particles that we look are basically ripples in the field. So if you take any particles with a negative electron, uh, negative uh, charge with a mass M and charge C and we get a field where it interacts with photons, positrons or maybe anything else. Now what we see is that it after interaction, the charge, the mass, the uh, I would say the uh, the total charge actually changes something different. So you see, I have just made hypothetical uh, names. Mass becomes m plus plus. Charge changes from c to c v minus minus etc. So as because with the interaction everything changes, renormalization replaces the initial postulated mass and charge of an electron with permanently experimentally observed mass and charge. So positrons and more massive particles like protons exhibit precisely the same observed charge as the electron even in the presence of much strong interaction and more intense clouds of virtual particles. So because of this change, because of this change in mass and everything, we require what is called a renormalization. So, we, we, thus, thus the war against infinities comes to an end. We establish quantum field theory taking care of the problems that arose and quantum field theory has this uh, established and with the invention of renormalization and using Feynman's diagram, quantum field theory arose as a complete theoretical framework. This is still the recap that I'm trying to tell you. We now need to understand that why do we need what is called a standard model in physics. Now you see that classical theory, special relativity, quantum mechanics, these are trying to get unified in a quantum field theory. General relativity and quantum mechanics is still striving to get a, a answer in string theory. Electromagnetic strong and weak force has already got a place in standard model. So you see that if we are trying to unify all the forces of nature into one safe house in a quest of one grand unified theory. So because electromagnetism, strong and weak force has already got a space in its standard model, generativity, quantum mechanics, classical field theory, special relativity, quantum mechanics, if it is finding a place in quantum field theory and Seng theory, then along with the standard model, we can find something which is a safe house and we can find one single theory which is called a grand unified theory. The fundamental interactions that happens between the particles, last lesson we have looked into it, we have got gravitational electromagnetic strong and weak force and these are the long distance forces and this uh, happens with subatomic distances. However, electromagnetism strong and weak force, uh, you know, takes care of something which is called a field and gravitation force is taking case for a curvature of space time. So some scientists hypothesize that there is a fifth force apart from these four, but this hypothesis remains speculative. So this is all in all what we try, wanted to tell you and this is a chart which you can just quickly look into the interaction, the mediators, the theory and what is the range and we see that gravity has got an infinite range as well as electromagnetism where strong and weak force has got certain range limitations. We also saw in the last lesson that there is something which is called a quantum era and if we plot a kind of a timeline then typically between 1925 to 1926 we see people like Max Planck, Heisenberg, Paul Dirac, Schrodinger, Louis de Broglie as well as Albert Einstein and other they ushered a new era of quantum physics. So these, this is a kind of a quick recap which I just wanted to tell you that you might have missed on this but this is always a good learning. Now we come to the present video which is called what is uh, called a quantization. Now at the beginning of the 20th century Max Planck and Albert Einstein completely revolutionized physics. In 1900 Max Planck derived the universal radiation law for stars by postulating the action in our world is quantized. Now let us discuss what is the fundamental physical principle. The action is the most important physical principle, I would say, uh, the physical phenomena in nature, right? So for any purpose, the action is basically what is called the product of energy and time. I have used symbols E and T for a small time interval. So the total action during a fixed time interval is then given by a kind of an integral or sum over over small time intervals. So the fundamental principle of least action tells us the following. A process in nature 
proceeds in such a way that action becomes minimal under appropriate boundary condition. This has got lot of interpretation, lot of philosophical interpretation also. However, I am not going into this. This is what is called the principle of least action. Now, the stationary action principle, also known as the principle of least action, is variational principle when applied to the action of a mechanical system. It is this equation. So, if you are not aware about the mathematical intricacies of a Lagrangian etc, you can just skip on to that. Just try to understand that this is a physical system where given two instances time t1 and t2, this is what it happens and this is basically uh, what we call is the basic equation. The po dot point that we uh, uh, find it is basically what is called a time derivative. So, mathematically we see that the principle actually reduces to this this uh, lowercase delta where it means a small change in which it and, and now we can summarize this in simple language that the path taken by the system times uh, system between time t1 and t2 with the configuration of q1 and q2 is the one for which the action is stationary for the first order so you see the entire action and the time derivative etc given however it reduces to zero now as we go ahead with quantization we should not forget that on the other part of the world there was similar kind of a contribution made but not in quantization quantum field theory it was done basically by Amy Noiter in 1918 uh, proved a fundamental mathematical theorem that we called a famous Noether theorem and I am in look if I can make a separate video on Noether theorem it tells us the conservation laws in physics are caused by the symmetries of physical system now to explain this principle for describing nature in terms of mathematics let us consider our solar system the motion of the sun as you see and the planets which moves around only depends on the initial position and initial velocities right so obviously what we can understand is that the motion of the solar system is invariant under if it uh, if it if you translate the time right spatial translation and rotational coordinates so this is responsible for conservation of energy momentum and angular momentum respectively so this is just a kind of a very crude understanding of Noether's theorem but it has got a much more deeper philosophical meaning but just to tell you this to understand that the basic principle in mathematics it remains the same I have just given a kind of a similar uh, you know uh, simple example okay now if we consider something mathematically and if we see that if a process of the physical system is possible for example x equals to xt then each process is also possible with a time translation and I have used k as the constant now if you take the Planck's law according to Planck the smallest amount of action is this which I have converted to joules per second uh, where we can see that one joule is basically one kilogram per meter, squ meter square per second square but this is actually the you know we call that is the smallest amount of action in nature now you see what happens is that we we find uh, the universal constant h uh, the famous Planck's constant uh, this Planck's constant is actually uh, something of very important now let us observe that the action taken uh, of a typical process in daily life actually has a magnitude of one joules really so therefore the Planck's constant we can say is very very tiny and here I have written that one joule is the amount of work done when a force of one Newton displaces a body of one meter in the direction so what we can understand from here is that the Planck's constant is something which is very very tiny now the thing is that what what happens what happens when this quantization is being applied and it has got an enormous consequence so what are the consequence coming up in the next part of the video consequence of quantization of action now I would like to take an example let us consider a mass point just a mass point on the real line which moves periodically and we get an equation like this here what happens is that time of this is denoted by t and this omega is the angular frequency of the harmonic oscillator which keeps on moving now is since the sine function has a period which is called a 2 pi which is a period right and the harmonic oscillator already has got the time period this one t equals to 2 pi upon omega so by definition we can say that the frequency nu 
uh, is actually the number of oscillation that this line takes in uh, one second. Hence, we can tell t equals to 1 upon v and we can obviously tell from this equation that omega equals to 2 pi nu. Now, if E, as we know, it denotes the energy of the harmonic oscillator, then the product, if we say ET, is a typical action value for the oscillations of the harmonic oscillator. So, what we can deduce from here? Something very important. According to the Planck's quantization of action, it seems it is quite natural to find out that ET equals to NH for obviously N equals to 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 so on. So, you see what we have done is that we have taken a mass point and we have tried to deduce the action value of the oscillations of the harmonic oscillator using um, a Planck's, uh, Planck's formula. Now, we go ahead with taking this Planck's quantization E equals to n h bar omega. Obviously, this is the Planck's quantization rule where n moves from 0, 1 to 2, 2 or so on. And uh, about 25 years later, this handsome gentleman, <laughs> Werner Heisenberg, invented basically what we called a full quantization procedure of classical mechanics using a commutative law, which is this, where P denotes momentum. Uh, I'm sorry, it should be Q. Yeah, it should be P, which is denoting uh, the uh, Q should denote the momentum and P actually denotes the quantum particle. So, uh, Heisenberg, if you take, actually, uh, you know, obtained uh, this, the precise formula and its importance is extreme. Heisenberg's quantum mechanics actually change the complete paradigm, the way we look into quantum physics. So, the, the difference is this. Classical physics, mostly the observables are real number barriers. In Heisenberg's approach, observables are nothing but abstract quantities. Okay, now you see that uh, around 50 years later, this great Norwegian mathematic mathematician Sophus Lai, uh, sorry, Sophus Lee found out that the commutative rule which we have taken plays a fundamental role when we are trying to study continuous symmetry group by means of what we call linearization. So, in 1934, this kind of an algebraic structure, which was now termed as Lie algebra, was coined by this person, Hermann Weyl, and Lie algebras and their generalization to infinite dimensions. So, you see that the Heisenberg's formula, which is E equals to h bar omega upon 2, this actually is the ground state of each harmonic, uh, I would say, uh, harmonic uh, oscillation, and, and it has a non-vanishing energy. Now, this actually causes a tremendous difficulty in quantum field theories. Since a quantum field has got infinite number of degrees of freedom, the ground state uh, has, uh, you, but the ground state actually has an infinite energy. How do we do with that? Now, in order to deal with this infinite amount of degrees of freedom, I would like to show a very simple demonstration which would, uh, you know, demonstrate things clearly coming in the next part of the video. So, here you see that we have got two states, the higher and the ground state. So, when we move the photon or the subatomic particle from the higher to a lower state, it gets in transcended into one electron transition. But it is just a one electron transition. Whereas if you are trying from, to move from high energy to ground state, if we get kind of a, a, a electromagnetic radiation, it yields to a photon. So it has got infinitely many degrees of freedom. So what happens is technically phase space offered by the electromagnetic field is infinitely large than offered by the atom. So, the left hand side actually shows that it is one electron transition here, it is many. So, that is that problem. Can we find a theory which would quantize electromagnetic field there by describing the classical electromagnetic field as well as the emission of photon by an electron dropping into a quantum state of lower energy? However, this is dealt in my earlier video in quantum uh, field theory where I have explained how this is done, which is called spontaneous emission. But I just wanted to tell you this is what it looks and this is the problem uh, which relates to what we called uh, infinite degrees of freedom and that what Heisenberg's uh, uh, equations sh showed. Okay, now we come to uh, Einstein and quantization. And we know that in 1905, Einstein published four fundamental papers on the theory of special relativity, the equivalence of mass and energy and the Brownian motion. 
So the Annelander physics, which actually tells that theory of special relativity changed our philosophy of space and time. So according to Einstein, there is nothing which is called an absolute time, but time has been changed from observer to observer. Now this follows from the surprising fact that the velocity of life has the same value in each inertial system. We know from the principle of relativity, what we find is that we can call m0 as a rest mass and p as the momentum vector. Then we get this kind of an equation where m0 is the rest mass, p is the momentum vector and e as the energy is given by this. Nothing great to explain. This is a quite common phenomena. I think everyone of us knows. Now you see that if I take a kind of a particle with a kind of a sub velocity of light, I mean to say it's not it's exactly not moving at the speed of light, but take a sub velocity of speed of light, then we have its mass as this. So if the particle gets a kind of a rest mass, then we get equal to m0 c square or the famous equal to mc square. And this actually is the magic energy that co governs the, uh, you know, uh, what we call the sun and the helium synthesis. Now, th this is obviously crucial in our formulation and, uh, for, uh, and unfortunately, this, this keeps the sun burning. So now that we have seen that how the Einstein has contributed into quantization, it is now time to see that who were the other contributors of Einstein's light particle hypothesis coming in this part of the video. So the first what we do is that we know that Mac James Clerk Maxwell actually basically conjectured in 1862 and the light is an electromagnetic wave. In 1886, Heinrich Hertz established the existence of electromagnetic wave by a famous experiment carried out at Kiel University in Germany when electromagnetic radiation is incident on the surface of a metal. The effect was first observed by Heinrich Hertz in 1887 and 15 years later, Philip Lennard observed that the maximum kinetic energy of the electron does not depend on the intensity of light. In order to explain photoelectric effect, Einstein postulated in 1905 that the electromagnetic waves are quantized. This that is light consists of light particles or light quanta which were coined as photons in 1926 to by the uh, by the a physical chemist Gilbert Levy. Okay, now as we know that we know E equals to H nu, where this uh, nu is basically the frequency of light, then what we can say is that the wavelength lambda, and we can see that the la dispersion relation can be well given by lambda nu equals to C. And from here, obviously, what we can do is that we can just change the equation and we get E equals to HC upon lambda. What does that mean? This means that a blue photon has more energy than a red one. And we know that the photon actually moves with the speed of light, its rest mass must be zero. So from this particular equation, what we get is that this one. And if we produce the angular frequency omega equals to 2 pi nu, then what we get is this formula. For obviously energy and the momentum vector, energy E and the momentum vector photon, P as. Okay, so light particles are quanta and we know that quantum particles are physical objects which possess a kind of a strange structure. So if we see that the energy of the electron is given by this formula and the so-called work function is given by this and it depends upon the binding energy of the electrons of the atoms on the metal. And if you take small similar frequencies, very small angular frequencies like omega, no electrons can leave their metal. Why? Because since there would be an exception that E would be less than zero and this is a kind of a contradiction. In fact, this has been observed in experiments by Millikan and I have not mentioned this, but we, it should be noted that he found that it is a typical constant in his experiment coincided with Planck's constant and for this, in 1921, Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of photoelectric effect. So this brings us to the end of today's video where we have talked uh, details, uh, mathematical details of the quantization of light, how and why do we need quantum field theory, what is the need for standard model and what are the problems of infinity and divergence and how we can deal with infinity. 
So I would immensely thank you for watching this video on quantum field theory. If you have liked it, please do subscribe to my channel Physics for Students. Click on the bell icon to get all the notification from Physics for Students. You can always email me at this email ID. And if you're interested, you can look to my second channel, which is dedicated to Einstein general relativity only. And you can further follow me on my Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn pages. Please do put up your comments. How do you feel and wh how? what are your comments? regarding that video so, so that I can creep on improving. Physics students will be soon back with many other interesting videos. Till then, goodbye.